And welcome to the Coral Conversations Context and Culture. So my name is uh, Cheryl Saleh and uh, today I'm going to be the chair for the seminar. With me to, uh, this morning is uh, Dr. Zechariah Goh. Now Zechariah, uh, Zechariah and I actually has had a very long relationship. Um, and um, in fact, when I first uh, encountered his work, I was actually in junior college. And <clears throat> those were amazing pieces. You know, uh, basically, it was uh, uh, what I heard was actually Kuchinta and Lok Soi Ten, uh, performed by a, a, another junior college choir. And since then, Zechariah has had uh, many, many, many works performed. Um, he has uh, uh, he did his uh, graduate studies in, in the University of Kansas, and he, currently he's a senior lecturer uh, at uh, the Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts in Singapore. Now, uh, <clears throat> today the the topic that Zechariah is going to be sharing with us is actually quite an important one, that the fact that uh, the discipline of com com uh, composition and composers are actually vital towards the preservation of folk song traditions and folk song heritage and the way in which composition is actually a, a, an important medium for us to preserve these sort of uh, cultures and traditions is something that uh, needs um, uh, needs more uh, conversations and discussions. So um, without further ado, I'm going to uh, uh, give the time to Dr. Zakaria Go. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon for friends in uh, Australia. And I'm very happy to be here, to be speaking about this uh, subject that is uh, very close to our hearts. And um, I, I will be just sharing from my perspective. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't really represent uh, the whole of Singapore or the whole of this Southeast Asia region. So I think I'd like to thank uh, Shario for his uh, invitation and uh, to set this up. So I will be talking about preserving folks, uh, sorry, preserving uh, cultural heritage through folk song arrangement for choir. So I'll start sharing my screen now. All right, um, so this is a big topic, uh, preserving cultural heritage through folk song arrangement for choir. So we start with the word preserving cultural heritage. Uh, who are we to do this? Uh, we are still part of this whole landscape of uh, people learning about our heritage. Uh, I think there are many steps to take before we actually think about preserving. <clears throat> we need to study, we need to investigate, we need to think about cultural appropriateness, we need to think about many different issues before we even start thinking about preserving a cultural heritage. It's great responsibility for us to do so as well. And we are all learning. <clears throat> and some of us are not professional in this area of uh, conserving and preserving uh, cultural heritage. So I think there's still a lot to learn. And that's why we're here for this conversation for all of us to really think about what needs to be done in the next 10, 20, 30 years down the road, how we can put together a consortium of uh, uh, great minds together. And this, I don't think we can do it alone as composers, as arranger. We need a team of people from the um, ethnomusicology site, uh, from, the, uh, from the cultural aspect, from the different places, people who can contribute to this uh, uh, preserving and conserving cultural heritage. Yeah, so that's a big topic. Um, I'm just going to speak uh, quite uh, quickly through what I experience and what I know in my uh, work with writing music for choir and also uh, for folk song arrangement for choir over the past 30 years. So this is the, a very, short definition from uh, New Growth Dictionary of Music, the product of a musical tradition that has been evolved through the process of oral transmission. So oral transmission is the key word. And um, just take for example, a lullaby from grandmother to mother and from mother to daughter. Um, it takes three generations of uh, transmitting the same song, uh, but 
we often uh, did not think about the variation and the improvisatory aspect of this. Actually, when a mother sing to the daughter um, and the daughter to her daughter, there are expectation, there are different levels of uh, care and love that is in the song. And then there may be some changes uh, when the song has been sung. So when a ethnomusicologist or composer take down this tune, we often just take a snapshot of what happened at that moment when the mother sing that lullaby for today. It may change tomorrow, or it may be just half of the song. They may repeat the chorus a few times. So uh, we need to be more mindful of the uh, fluidity and the uh, ever-changing aspect of folk song, and not just take a picture of it and then preserve it, you know, uh, through our writing. And that's just the tune itself. We're not talk even talking about uh, arranging. Yeah. So the next thing is we will talk about Southeast Asia, um, the ASEAN. Not all the members of Southeast Asia are members of ASEAN. Here we have a few states. We call it ASEAN states and Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam. Um, I, I list out these um, states to give us an idea of uh, music that has been arranged for folk, uh, for choir in this region. Um, I think Philippines is known for doing a lot of this. Uh, over the past uh, 40 or 50 years, and uh, followed by the Indonesia, and then maybe Singapore. Um, the rest of the world, like Thailand, in the past 10 years or so, uh, just beginning to work with folk material. And um, from my friends in uh, Thailand, they actually say that they don't really have a long tradition of folk, uh, sorry, chorus singing tradition. So it's different from Singapore and uh, Philippines who were uh, colonized um, in the past. So we uh, inherited the um, chorus singing tradition. Yeah. So out of these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten members of the uh, ASEAN states, uh, I think maybe three or four uh, has begun uh, doing a lot of uh, um, arrangement of uh, music for choir and not just for folk song, uh, but also original composition. For Singapore, we have 75.9% uh, who are Chinese, 15% uh, of ethnic Malay, 7.5% of Indian, and 1.6% of Eurasians and others. Well, for lack of a better word for others, uh, we'll just put it there for now. Uh, we have more than just uh, uh, Eurasian. We have many other uh, people that are of different races that are the minorities in Singapore as well. It actually contributed uh, a, a lot to our Singapore cultural heritage as well as uh, economy. Now, um, let's just go to our friend, uh, Bella Bartok, who was before ethnomusicology was used, this term, uh, he was already collecting folk song and um, over the course of the past 70 years, 80 years, uh, since the death of uh, Bella Bartok, uh, more awareness of uh, folk music uh, and how it has been studied and used in, um, uh, in, in original work or, trans uh, or arrangement has been uh, attributed to what Bella Bartok said. So for example, uh, number one, uh, there are three points here. Number one, to, to uh, paraphrase this, is to uh, arrange the folk song in the same way that it is heard in, 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 in its uh, indigenous environment. For example, a pentatonic melody with simple uh, harmony uh, of uh, pentatonic informed harmony rather than using the regular 1451 chord. And the second one is to use uh, um, folk music uh, and its different styles of uh, writing plus uh, modern techniques. And the third one is to include the folk song as a style of music to, to follow the certain 
style of, of the, the music of folk song, but uh, as an original work. So um, he has already set this uh, discipline for us to follow, and uh, we're very happy that uh, we now can uh, think about using folk song in three different stages. Um, next, I'd like to talk about this uh, rather interesting terms, um, colonization, from the word colonization. Um, colonization is a word that uh, I use here to express the um, Western style of choral singing um, to appropriate folk music material. So a lot of uh, choral singing in non-Western uh, world are actually um, not arranged in SATB format. Um, it doesn't follow a lot of the Western uh, traditions such as chorale traditions, uh, such as uh, hymn, uh, uh, hymnology, and, and so on. So um, something that we borrow from the West to with folk song, material yeah, using folk music uh, but uh, with the choral style that the west has taught us uh, into our arrangement and uh, one of the the first the next word colonization uh, i'm referring to singapore uh, under british rule uh, for uh, more than 100 years and uh, philippines under spanish rule for a few hundred years and then um, Indonesia under the Dutch rule, uh, and so on. So um, the colonization uh, brought about uh, uh, a new style of uh, working with uh, music material that uh, is not known to the indigenous people, uh, the original inhabitant of these uh, places. Uh, but over many years, it has uh, become something that we slowly uh, used in our chorus setting. Yeah, so harmonization of folk tunes is also a Western uh, idea. For example, the SATB format, uh, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, uh, the hierarchy of uh, where these voices are placed are also something very Western. And choralization is, is the use of choral musical style for folk uh, music. And hymnalization is the use of uh, folk tune in the style of a hymn, especially in the church. Uh, when they use folk material, um, folk songs from the local vernacular area, in, and um, uh, uh, use it to reharmonize for the use of uh, church worship. Yeah. So I'd like to pause here very quickly, Sha, so that um, maybe I'll have some uh, uh, to and fro with the uh, audience here before I continue. Sure, sure thing. Um, there, are, are there any thoughts uh, or concerns with regard to the things that um, Zachariah has said? Anyone I, from the uh, who are here, you can uh, share with us uh, some of your thoughts of what I've just talked about briefly. Do you have um, do you have any examples of uh, some of the folk tunes that have been incorporated into the uh, into the hymns? Um, there is a song from actually India uh, that is used in one of the tune in the hymn. That sounds like. Let me think. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. For the longest time, I thought this was something from America. Uh, and uh, the harmonization of that song and so on. Uh, and then one day, I, I'm quite sure that I saw as in India, Indian origin. So um, it has been sung quite differently uh, mm -hmm. in a hymn uh, in the church worship. It's quite different 
not saying that it's right or wrong, but uh, we can no longer hear how it sounded like. Uh, but this is transplanting uh, a folk tune into a uh, hymn, hymn style, uh, which is quite different from what it sounded like originally. So I think uh, we need to be careful when we are working with material. And it has been uh, preserved in the style of a hymn yes. uh, for many years after that. But uh, what do we actually know of that song in its original uh, setting? Yeah. So that's just an example. There are many of such uh, themes. Okay. Um, any, are there any questions from the members of the audience? I was just going to say that's an interesting point that, that we need, we can think through. Of course, what we have to remember there is that hymns do have a special function. Yes. And, um, and therefore, you're kind of in the church, in, in the, you know, like the musicological response is um is well we should be more respectful of the authenticity and we should try and understand that the church response itself though is it's not the opposite but its intention is quite different and it's actually saying for all these hymns and there are a lot of them that we are we are embracing the oneness of christian community kind of around the world and in fact we are de in a sense we're decolonizing music by having South African hymns and Indian hymns and so on. Um, so so, for, so within the church, it's seen as positive, although from the musicological perspective, um, we might have to think otherwise. And I know you'll agree with me. It's just worth pointing out. Yeah, Graham, thank you so much. And uh, there's so many layers to this uh, issue. And um, I think um, what you point out is very true. Um, I've sung in church, uh, I've sung all, sung all this hymn in the church for a long time. And um, it, it works very well for me as during the worship as well. So I think uh, these are things that we are to need to be aware, uh, especially as uh, 21st century, uh, where we have a lot of uh, support from technology that help us to uh, research. And uh, it's, it's so much better now that we can find out more. Um, later, I'll be sharing with all of us the Asian uh, way of working with uh, uh, folk tune and how it's used in the church as well. Now I'll continue to share. Um, choral music uh, in Asia uh, covers this and it's just right after we have just spoken about the hymn. Um, we use a vocal tapestry, um, different layers of same tune, of, of different tunes or different layers of sound, the, the different strata of uh, ostinati, ostinato, and uh, different uh, short fragments of the, the, the tune of uh, different folk song. They can be put together like a vocal tapestry. Uh, it's like a little bit like a collage of different sound. And this is uh, often heard in a lot of the work uh, by our Filipino uh, counterpart, our Filipino friends. Um, and then also vocal orchestration, uh, interesting uh, terms, uh, and actually it refers to the very instrumental sound um, that is uh, constructed uh, for the choir. And uh, madrigalization, um, this word was uh, borrowed from uh, Sir Yudi Palaluan, who is the uh, conductor of the Singapore Symphony Chorus. Um, when he was uh, a member of the Philippine Madrigal Singers, he often uh, had to arrange music in the style of madrigal, but folk song. And also choralization, to use the chorus style, the Western chorus style, to uh, arrange a folk melody. So these are the similar, um, a little bit more uh, direct, uh, representation of what we heard, uh, we were discussing about the hymn, yeah? And then choral colotomy. Colotomy is used to describe the uh, gamelan or the cooling tang. Gamelan from Indonesia and cooling tang from Philippines. The different layers of rhythm, the rhythmic structure, the, the lower instrument playing longer value and the higher instruments playing uh, 
faster note value. And it all comes together in a very closely kneaded sound of a very intricate orchestration. And that's color, colotomy uh, in a nutshell. But we can, you can uh, have a listen to gamelan music and uh, you will understand what I'm trying to say. Quarter and quinto, uh, ostinato, um, the use of this interval, which is quite, uh, um, is something that is found in uh, pentatonic scale. Yeah, C, G, D, A, E, A, for example, there are all a lot of interval of fifth and uh, fourth. And a lot of folk music from this area, uh, this five note scale, which is uh, N hamitonic, which is five notes without half tones. Um, one of them would be what we know as the pentatonic scale. And we have uh, syllabic drones, the use of simple uh, long sustained tone uh, and then uh, with different syllable. So the, the, the word changes, but the long tone is used. We can hear this a lot in the choral uh, arrangement across Southeast Asia. Um, and then Ningum and uh, Nuguni, uh, for, forgive me for the wrong pronunciation, uh, this is of Jewish origin. And these are words that are sung like la la la, or uh, which doesn't really have any meaning in terms of what the words uh, represent. Uh, they are also known as non lexiconal syllables, meaning that it, the words doesn't mean something that we know in a language, but it is used in worship. Uh, and then it is, it represents a certain kind of feeling and expression. Uh, and that the community who sings this uh, are very sure of what they are doing at the moment during worship. So it is not just uh, nonsensical syllables, but there, are, there has a lot of meanings in those words that are not known in language, yeah? And the ethnodoxology, uh, eth ethnic music in used in church, and Asian hierarchy in choral music. This is what we understand by how um, the different uh, voices are used. Uh, we don't really have real basses and real alto, those that are that can really go down way below C and B flat and so on. We have a lot of baritone. Um, uh, in, in this part of the world, like uh, we, uh, I'm just conducting the uh, men's choir and our basses are mostly baritone uh, and our altos are maybe mezzo-ish. So it will be different for us to maybe some of, or we should think about how we use the SADP hierarchy differently. Maybe it's some kind of a three-part writing or maybe uh, different arrangement of the, the voices, yeah? It need not be, in soprano alto tenor bass, it could be uh, female voices in two part and male voice in uh, just one part or so on and so forth. There are, there are many ways to go about it. And this is what our Asian uh, community, uh, our Southeast Asian community has come up with our chapter, I call it the Asian chapter, how we work with uh, choral music. And uh, again, I'd like to pause here so that we can uh, maybe talk about this. Uh, in the discussion, yeah. Sha? Well, um, you know, I think one of the things that, um, you know, you, you came up with this whole list of sort of like framings and, and methods and all that. Um, I think one of the questions that, you know, uh, will probably be useful in this conversation is how do we, where, how, where do we start? especially for younger composers. I mean, you know, in, in fact, most of the composers that are trained in Singapore will probably be trained under a very, you know, Western, uh, Western music theory paradigm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how do they kind of discover or understand better some of these uh, terms and terminologies? Where, where can they go for resources? Thank you so much for this question. And uh, I think the, uh, I will point us towards uh, a few of these places and, uh, and a community of composers who are aware of this kind of arrangement style where how we appropriate uh, uh, folk song into choral setting and uh, our friends in the philippines uh, under the late uh, francisco feliciano 
who set up uh, Alien, Asia Institute of uh, Liturgical Music, where he trained uh, composers from around Southeast Asia and as, even as far as uh, uh, Africa to think about choral music and think about folk music and how it is put together. And I also have my system of uh, working with uh, folk music that I will share later. But I think it's more than just teaching the methods. You need to have the concept of uh, embracing folk music and really understand the sensitivity that uh, we need to be aware of when we are working with material such as uh, folk song. And that, that's why I, in my opening statement, I talk about uh, maybe it takes more than just composer. We need to work with ethnomusicologists and we need to work with uh, different people from the cultural uh, sector to help us understand and to be more aware and to be more sensitive. And music is just one of the arts form. We, uh, we should be immersed in, uh, in fine arts, in, uh, uh, in dance, in theater to really have a holistic understanding. Uh, in fact, the uh, arts uh, is in the indigenous sense are not uh, segregated into music, uh, fine arts and theater and so on in the uh, original setting. You go to a performance uh, in uh, Indonesia and you see that it's part theatrical, part musical, part uh, performing arts and, you know, and, you know, it's, it's just very uh, deep that we need to go, we need to sink deep into this issue and uh, start to understand. Um, yeah, I think um, we'll walk through, every one of us, a little bit uh, towards this uh, direction later in my talk, yeah? Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I think, uh, and this is just a comment, you know, well, I mean, it's, it seems that this conversation is in part predicated on the work done by composers. I think uh, the conductors and the performers themselves will also need to do the same sort of work. You are very, very, very right. And uh, yeah. thank you for bringing that, that up. And then I think our conductors uh, are getting more acquainted with the Southeast Asian or Asian choral work um, mm. over the years. But uh, sometimes they are performed out of context. Um, mm. It is performed as how they see it from an audience perspective and how uh, all this exciting sound uh, should be heard, but maybe not in uh, without enough research to understand how this piece come about. And I think um, I was just talking to a panel of uh, composers and uh, conductors uh, over the last two weeks um, mm. from Southeast Asia, and we, we discussed about uh, the lack of education and outreach, and then it is it's upon our shoulder as well as educator to come up with a consortium of sort of uh, people who are in choral music uh, composing or arranging or conducting mm -hmm. to teach the audience as well, as well as uh, the fellow conductors to have uh, a lot of outreach and uh, some kind of experiential workshop where they can actually understand just like some of the uh, improvisation workshop I give about folk song and folk song uh, uh, improvisation. So these things uh, should be in more commonplace. It's just like we spend many years as a choral uh, conductor learning mm -hmm. the Western art form. So for example, we learn about leader, we learn about chanson, we learn about uh, British art song, and then we learn about the uh, important uh, choral literature from the late medieval to renaissance to uh, to the uh, romantic to impressionist and to modern so that we are we are trained over many years i'm, I'm talking about uh, a choral conductor that I spent about 20 years in school or even more maybe 30 years to have a handle of what the west uh, passed down to us in the yeah. choral uh, fields but also, I think in Southeast Asia and Asian repertoire, we need to give them this same kind of uh, immersion mm -hmm. and also education as well as outreach. And I think it is our duty uh, and our responsibility to 
give this kind of instruction for Quora practitioner out there to really be able to use this when they're conducting a piece of music. And it's very diverse in Southeast Asia as well. There's a number of folk music and folk tradition is so, so white and vast. Um, and I think uh, we have to start beginning to write a curriculum, Shah and I, and <laughs> maybe others. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's my quick uh, response to that. Yes. Yeah, I, I, just to add on to that you know, particular thing, um, and you know, I mean, it's 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 kind of um, almost superfluous for me to say that there's a form of epistemic erasure whereby you know, in when you're a conductor, you are trained in the Western paradigm and all that, and a, a lot of the conductors have this. Well, at least in Singapore, there's a fixation on getting it technically correct, but the techniques, the the, no, the notion of technicism is always predicated on the West. On, on Western canon, on Western uh, theory and all that, without having uh, an impetus or desire to actually kind of find out where the cultural roots or traditions are for, of the pieces that they perform. Um, and in part, there's, you know, we, we have seen in Singapore to the lot of perform, uh, 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 performance of pieces that, uh, while technically sound, uh, make very questionable you know, aesthetic or artistic sort of decisions with regard to how the narrative has actually been said. So yeah, I, and I am in, in full agreement with you, Zachariah. That this there's there's a need for us to re-educate ourselves to 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 relook at how we do and we approach these sort of musics. Are yeah. there any questions? Uh, any other uh, comments? Uh, thoughts from the audiences? Yeah. Oh, there's a, a quite a long one in the chat. Okay, so. Um, I'll read this out then. Thank you, Prof. Zachariah, for this valuable sharing. In this brief moment, we already know that choral music is one of the avenues to bring music alive uh, through voice of for audience, which will infuse choral discipline, stage, history of countries, race, culture, folk, and religion, art, literature forms. How about adapting choral music by leveraging on universal materials and topics that you mentioned by, about motherly love across generations, emotions, language, themes, or local song works? It would be a great privilege to work with a multifaceted consortium of choral professionals, practitioners, and conductors in social cultural academia and industry veterans curriculum that are trained to adapt all these concepts and sensitivities. How can we then streamline and optimize the system of arranging and producing many choral works along with supporting local song works with international partners? I would just suggest if local Mandarin songs, uh, lo local Mandarin song works are adapted for choirs. Okay, um, a quick response to that is uh, thank you for this wonderful response. And it's, yeah, it's a daunting task for us to uh, educate and to teach uh, everyone to understand more about uh, folk music. Uh, like what we've just, I think some of this we have already um, uh, um, addressed earlier on between Sha and I. Um, maybe a little bit about the Chinese songs uh, that has been uh, arranged for choir. They were many such uh, occasions where we work with, uh, I think we have to mention to Leung Yung Pin, my uh, teacher, uh, the cultural medallion and uh, pioneer composer from Singapore, who had uh, already set uh, a lot of, you know, setting in stone, uh, so to speak, for uh, arrangement and, uh, uh, and folk music as well, traditional music used in choral literature. And there's, pre-independence, we are talking about before 1965, he has already, he had already started doing all this. And then after independence, continued to write and then uh, to, uh, to the day he passed away. So he has already written more than, I think 70 or 80 works for choir. It's a lot of, uh, a wide range of repertoire that we can study about how he used uh, the language Chinese Mandarin and also dialects as also, he also used Malay, uh, uh, Tamil uh, and different languages into his uh, arrangement. It's a very good uh, way to study how our pioneer composer actually used uh, folk music as well as traditional musical style into composition. He was one of the earliest uh, composer who actually uh, dealt with the uh, onomatopoeic sound uh, of the uh, dragon dance. And um, it's not vocally easy for many choir to sing it uh, because of the placement of the voice, the vowels and the consonants. <clears throat> but now it has become a, a, a very common uh, 
piece from Singapore, and there are many Western choir, uh, Filipino choir, who have sung this piece as well, uh, the dragon dance. So I think, yes, uh, to, uh, in short, many work uh, from his generation. There are other Chinese composer who also written a lot of work for choir, uh, something we can study. And also for the, um, since 1980s, uh, with the beginning of the Xin Yao uh, 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 movement, um, a few years ago, I was approached to arrange music for Xin Yao, and I have uh, um, actually encouraged them to um, engage younger composer and arrangers such as Benedict Go and uh, Kit Yang to do this arrangement. Uh, so there are activities such as these and avenues for uh, uh, people to think about uh, traditional music and Singaporeanness uh, in their arrangement. This is just a quick, uh, a very short answer to your response and question. So now I'll go back to my slides again. Okay, let me, uh, okay, sorry. Okay, this is from uh, Aileen and uh, this is a online um, article um, about the music in the Christian adaptation of Christian liturgy, non-Christian cultural background uh, in, Online, so they talks about the Western style, uh, uh, the church music in um, Philippines, uh, its development over the past two hundred years, not quite four hundred years, but I think most of it concentrated on the, the past two hundred years. So, amid students from different Christian community from all over Asia and Asia Pacific, uh, even from Africa, it emphasizes of music in the liturgy and encourages the use of indigenous instrument in liturgical. Uh, celebration. This is from uh, this article and it's talking about Alien that I have uh, earlier on mentioned, uh, Asia Institute of uh, Liturgy and Music um, and attributed to Francisco Feliciano, a man who is responsible for uh, teaching many young composer of his time and also a veteran composer by, by now who are actively composing uh, and we are talking about Dawood Kosasi from Indonesia and uh, UD Palaguan and so on. There are many, many wonderful composers who are actually trained uh, in this institution. Uh, so the word enculturation, the adaptation of Christian liturgy to a non-Christian cultural background. So actually some of these uh, songs were used. Uh, they are not from a, a Christian perspective uh, and liturgy but is used uh, to, with the words, um, appropriate words for Christian worship. So this has been done uh, a lot in the uh, Asian Institute of Liturgy and Music. And this is from a, a short uh, interview uh, with Palaluan. Uh, I, just want, I just want to talk a few, about a few words, choralization, magicalization, uh, these few words that he mentioned in this, um, um, as a short sentence uh, paragraph here. Uh, so he also said that he have learned this in, uh, in practice um, while he was a member of the Philippine Madrigal Singers. He has to arrange music, uh, folk music from Philippines in a style of a madrigal and, uh, and choral music setting and how it has it, it then uh, become common uh, in Philippines and continue to grow and uh, pass down to younger uh, arrangers uh, from Philippines after that. So I think um, we can have actually something to follow. It's already been done by many of our colleagues in Philippines and uh, Indonesia, and we can study these works. They are now, some of these works are available. Uh, for example, the pieces by uh, Pamugund and also uh, Popo Alimpaco by um, Francisco Feliciano. We can purchase this score, we can study them, we can talk to the people who were um, uh, 
present in the time of uh, Francisco uh, Feliciano, uh, who knows what he actually uh, was doing, how he actually was uh, using this uh, folk song in his uh, uh, composition. So I think there's a lot for us to learn from these people, from our uh, friends and colleagues from Philippines and Indonesia um, in terms of uh, folk song arrangement. Um, here are some of the different techniques and style of uh, folk song arrangement for choir that I have come up with through my experience and through my studies over the past uh, 20 years or so. My first folk song arrangement or composition was uh, in 1993. It was for uh, Tomase Junior College and it was called Dayong Sampan. Um, a few years ago, I think it was 2017, the Philippine Magical sang it. Um, it's quite difficult for an average choir to sing, and so it has not been performed uh, a lot. Since it was performed by the Tamase Junior College back in 1993, um, the second or third performance of it was just in 2015 with Nelson uh, Choir, and also 2017 with the Madrigal Singers. So um, over the past 30 years, I have uh, studied and worked with uh, a lot of uh, traditional music, study a lot of traditional music as well as folk music, and to come up with a system that may, be, may work very well uh, when you are arranging uh, folk music. So these are the few using drones, ostinato, the various types of ostinatos that we mentioned earlier on, quinto and quarto ostinato, syllabic uh, ostinato, parallel intervals. Uh, I know perfect fifth and fourth, parallel fourth and fifth are frowned upon. And the use of cluster, um, call and response, the use of canon, and very simple harmonic progressions, improvisation, onomatopoeics, vocables, and the fact that a lot of Chinese language are toner, the use of tonal sound in a piece of music. I'd like to pause here again uh, to hear if anyone has any questions. Any thoughts, any questions? No? Okay. I think, uh, you know, I mean, in the interest of time, I think we should move on. Okay. I think uh, there's not a lot of slides left. So yeah. I'll just finish them. And then uh, we can answer other questions when we have them. Sure, sure. Yeah, we can leave the questions at the end. Then. All right. That's good too. Um, okay. Um, I just put a link of the musicc.com here so that we can copy and click on this and see the, uh, what is on there. There are many composers who are under my training, who has uh, learned the basic craft of uh, folk song arrangement. I say basic because there's still a lot to be learned. Uh, I have guided them through um, study of the uh, folk song as well as the use of uh, some of the techniques that I've referred to earlier on in their composition for choir. Um, and they are all still learning. And I'm happy that there is a platform where these folk songs uh, in the style of a choir uh, has been published by Music C. And it's wonderful that uh, choir are now able to uh, go to this website and find this recording, uh, sorry, find this score and sing. Uh, and in fact, some of our Taiwanese choir have sung some of my pieces that I put on Music C as well, some of the Malay folk song. So I think it's a very good platform for Southeast Asian composer to have an avenue to showcase their folk songs. So I encourage us to take a look at this uh, website um, and this site and see what kind of music they offer and some of these wonderful composers and their works. I would like to talk a bit about my uh, composition. Um, there are four categories that I compose. Uh, the use of folk song, 
the use of traditional music, the use of literature and poems, uh, historical uh, from Tang Dynasty and so on, and then uh, sacred music as well. So these are some of the works uh, that I wrote for, with folk song uh, material. Dayong Sampan, uh, as I mentioned earlier, was 1993. So next year will be the 30th year for this work. Reminiscence of Hainan, 1995. Lok Suite, 1997, that was uh, performed twice this year by the uh, Vox Camerata uh, uh, related choirs, the CCRP and the Chema Singers and also um, Counting Frog, which is a folk song from China that I wrote for uh, VJC many years ago. Uh, Triptych is a collection of three folk songs. One of them is in Hainanese. It has only been performed once. Um, I think it can uh, see the light of day again in the near future. Um, and then we have folk song number six. Number seven is Kopi Susu. Uh, this one is actually based on the uh, song, uh, folk song, uh, Kopi Susu, and it was actually commissioned by a choir from Zhanghua, which is somewhere in, the, in Taiwan. And they actually sang this song, uh, which I wrote for them, and knowing that they have some Kambiata voices, young male voices that are changing. Um, so I wrote it in the style of SSAA, TB-ish. So that means they're not really tenor and bass, but they're man voices in two parts and so on. And Lengang Kangkong, uh, which I revised for SA Choir and uh, two Atalaya folk songs. These are actually commissioned by the Atalaya people, indigenous people of Taiwan um, that uh, will be singing this in September as well as later part of this year. So they are indigenous people who sing in a choral setting. So I have uh, studied their style of music and worked closely with them over the past two, three months. And um, it's very rewarding experience for me because it's not sung in the regular choral style. The vocalization is different. The tuning is different. They sing naturally in pure fifth and fourth. And I'm talking about the, not the uh, well-tempered tuning of fifth and fourth, but very pure, like those found in the uh, harmonic series. Next, I have composition for with traditional music. The first one, uh, 2003, is based on Gamelan music that's commissioned by the, uh, single, um, the core curricular activity branch of the uh, Ministry of Education. Irama Belia, based on traditional uh, Malay, Chinese, and uh, Carnatic music uh, in 2015 for the celebration of Singapore's 50th anniversary. Rhythmology, uh, a collection of three different kinds of style of music for the SMU uh, community. Uh, Four Tones, which is a piece of music that uh, talk about the Chinese Putonghua, uh, the Four Tones, in Yang, Sang, Qi. So actually they sang uh, different four notes, uh, four words, phrases, or proverbs in uh, this this setting in this hierarchy. Dum, 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 dum. And number five, Zhuli Guan is actually the use of Suzhou Ping Tan, which is uh, the style of the Suzhou musician who plays the pipa and the uh, sanxian, and they sing as well, it's, it's like something like a speech singing. So you hear this work, Julie uh, Guan, you can hear that. And number six, Ngo Hiang. Ngo Hiang is actually a local food, uh, something that we know, the Chinese people know. Five Spices is called. In this piece commissioned by the Singapore's uh, SYC on Zong Singers, I use a street vendors calls such as, Te Si Siu Dai, Kopi Ping, Kosong, and so on. So vendors calls are used in this piece of music. Um, it's only performed once uh, in America. It has not been performed in Singapore. Uh, so it's been silenced for seven years. I hope to hear it again. Uh, I've not heard it live myself. And the last one, uh, music that are influenced by Chinese literature and uh, historical uh, contexts, uh, such as 
Hikayat Hang Tua, based on a Malay legend uh, from the uh, uh, Malay annals, and the Da Feng Ge, which is from, uh, made up of three Chinese probes or poems. And Yue Ren Ge is actually from an uh, ancient people of the Yue, which is not Han. Uh, so it's one of the earliest texts by the Yue people that has been uh, uh, that is still uh, known today. Yeah. And then I have the sacred music. Uh, as a Christian, these are some of the works that I've written with sacred texts. Jehovah's Army, Rose of Sharon, Three Psalms, uh, and Amore Senza Fine, and Nisi Dominus. Number five has not been performed yet. Uh, it's commissioned by Diocesan Choir from uh, Hong Kong. Um, it was uh, written just before the pandemic. And since then, I think Hong Kong has not completely uh, returned to chorus singing. So I'm hoping to hear this work live one day in the near future. Uh, that concludes my uh, site presentation. So now we are good to uh, have a, a real conversation uh, with everyone and anyone who are interested. Well, um, I'm I'm quite mindful of the time. Um, I think we have, you know, perhaps uh, if there's uh, one or two quick questions from the audience. Any thoughts, comments, concerns? Anybody? Yeah, we're very we're very shy, very shy audience today. Hey? Yes, I have a question. Ah, uh, yes, please. I have a question about um the process of writing, for, uh, or arranging folk songs from a culture that may not be your own, especially in the context of um the compo composition industry where like commissions may require you to um, produce music for a certain purpose and context. And how, how do you navigate that and negotiate um, the politics behind like appropriating for better or for worse a different cultures like um, folk culture? Thank you for your <laughs> question. Yeah. Um, may I know if you are a composer or conductor? Uh, neither. <laughs> oh, neither. It's okay. It's okay. I just. I'm an enthusiast. Uh, okay. Yes, okay. choral enthusiast. I mean, I, I come from a, an art history background. So my, my question is also very much informed by uh, curatorial decisions and the process of like co curating in a, in a museum or an institutional context um, and, and more of a visual arts uh, uh, background, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for your question. And this is a very uh, important uh, one because I am Chinese and I'm Hainanese. I'm a Singaporean. So I have a few hats that I'm wearing. So for example, as a Chinese Hainanese, one of my earliest folk song was a Hainanese folk song that I arranged. That's very close to my heart something that I, a language that I speak, I speak Hainanese, and then I'm ethnic Chinese. So this is the closest thing for me. And then I did Dayong Sampan, which is Chinese origin, uh, but something that is from this region with Malay words. So maybe a bit of the Peranakan uh, aspect to this, um, which I also am part of. I'm part of the Singapore community. Then I have, uh, Malay songs that uh, it took me about 25, 26 years to finally write something in Malay uh, language, which I know some uh, conversationally, I'm uh, able to speak Malay not so well, but that's why it took me a longer time to, to be able to work with uh, the material from uh, Malay heritage. And it takes a lot of study uh, the study of the language, the study of the style of music and so on. It, it is a lot of work. Then for the um, 
music that is outside of my, uh, for example, the Thayatu, uh, um, Atalaya people from the Ab Ab Aboriginal people from Taiwan. Uh, it took me about five, six years to finally agree to do this uh, after I have done extensive research. Actually, most of the time, I would encourage them to engage um, their own people. So it's like teaching someone to fish rather than you know, catch the fish for them. So my uh, folk song arrangement courses that I give around uh, Southeast Asia are always very fruitful to hear the arrangement of the native people arranging their folk song. For example, a uh, Malaysian uh, student who arranged Malay, Malay songs, a uh, Philippine Indonesian student to arrange the Filipino and Indonesian song. The re it's always very rewarding to hear. There's something that is lost in translation. Um, Singapore is a multi-racial country, allow us to tap on different uh, uh, cultural uh, aspect of uh, music from our part of the world. Although it may not be the closest thing to us, like some of the culture may be a little bit further away from us, but it's something that uh, we are familiar with. But if I were to compose, to arrange something from Croatia, for example, or Bosnia, that would be a bit too far away for me. And then with the amount of research I do will still be, I still feel a little bit distant to it. Um, so that's just a quick response to your question. I think uh, education, awareness, research, study is important uh, before we start work on an arrangement. Um, or else it's just sound. We need to uh, mm -hmm. we need to survey more than just sound. We need to study more about cultural language, especially uh, and uh, manner of speech, which can be lost in uh, arrangement and in, in, in singing. 